Hello. So we should blow up schools. We should blow up universities. We hear this. Uh, we should reform them. We should change them dramatically. We hear this too. Uh, and we should probably do all this. How and why? One of the things that seems to be missing from a lot of the conversations about what needs to happen, whether you're rolling your own, or whether you are going to a regular school, or whether you are trying to reform schools, is uh, how do minds work? How does learning work? How's this all supposed to go together? So let's spend a little time talking about some myths about mind, uh, what are the real answers to these things, and then maybe a little envisioning about what a system looks like when you uh, try to apply all these things at once. So um, myth number one, you are the voice in your head. Well, this seems kind of clear. You're listening to me, and if I suddenly start speaking in a high, squeaky voice, and you're starting to think this man is a very strange gentleman, which is true, right? Your little monologue is running all the time. I mean, what else could there be, right? That's you. All right, let's try a little thought experiment. Raise your hand if you drive a car. Oh, thank God. I tried this in Singapore. It was a total disaster. Okay, okay, good. Okay, you, most basically you all drive a car. This is good. All right, now raise your hand if you've had the following experience. You set out driving to place A, and then you're thinking about life and work and family and the TEDx conference, and, and oh my, you end up at place B. Now, I usually you end up at like at a coffee bar, and it's like, oh shoot, I did it again. I'm so old, I have the metaphor. I put in the wrong program card. Anybody remember punch cards? No, 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 my kids think I was born before fire. Never mind. So, <laughs> but think about that for a second, all right? You're at place B, you meant to be at place A, you laugh at yourself, you pull back, you start driving off, but we never actually think about this. Who drove you to place B? <laughs> no, 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 really, really. You, you were having a happy monologue, or maybe not so happy, about family and work, and hopefully happily about the TEDx uh, event, right? Who was in charge of a ton of metal moving at 50, 60 miles an hour? while you were busy thinking. And now you're on the 101. Look left, look right. Who's in charge of those tons of metal? Huh? Right? When you have that fender bender and you get together, that's not who was driving. Right? I mean, this is really peculiar when you think about it. Now, cognitive psychologists looking at expertise all over the place find the same phenomenon. Experts have things that are subconscious. In fact, a lot of the processing experts do is completely subconscious, right? And we don't think about that when we build our learning environments or our training environments. Now, another interesting aspect of all this uh, subconscious uh, 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 things that happen is this, these processes, when they run, they can grab attention very quickly. So you're driving along, you're thinking about work or life or whatever, and all of a sudden, some idiot opens a passenger door right in front of you. You slam on the brakes, and you're immediately thinking about driving, and how do I get around this guy, and you know, evolution at work, why did he do that? And you know, three minutes later, you're thinking about business or life or whatever, right? So these subconscious modules, when they get out of their comfort zone, they can immediately grab conscious attention. Because your conscious abilities, that talky-talky part of your mind, is supremely good at complex problem solving. And learning is about as complex a problem-solving task as we have, right? So th this is really interesting. Now, how, so how do, we, how do we think about this? How do we apply this, right? How, how do we think about what experts then really are? What, what is expertise? What does it look like? Well, one view is experts are just, they just know more stuff. I mean, isn't that what we pay them to do? They know stuff? That's how it should work, right? They know more stuff. Well, that's... I, you know, maybe they do know more stuff, but it's more complicated than that. When, when I was uh, in medical school, uh, I did a rotation at uh, the Massachusetts General Hospital, which is one of the tertiary care, you know, maximum amazing places out in Boston. And I was in an infectious disease rotation. And at MGH, the only cases that come there are what you'd call zebras, you know? They're the really hard cases, because otherwise they'd all be solved elsewhere, right? So they'd come to us. And you know, we were, you know, Harvard Medical students, we felt pretty hot, you know? So, you know, we could solve most things, right? But every now and then, something would come our way and we couldn't solve it. It was too hard. So we'd call an expert, a real infectious disease expert, right? And these guys are amazing people, right? 
So I remember this one time, I, I had to, we had this problem, I called the expert, the guy comes flapping up the hallway, his little white lab coat, stirring the breeze, he's looking at his watch, and you know what he's thinking, he's thinking, if I get these guys out of here, I can make lunch, right? That's what he's thinking, okay? And he's, he comes up, he grabs the chart, he flips through it, we're yammering at him, and he's like, fine, 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 okay, right? And he flips the chart, puts the chart back, he walks over to the patient's door, he opens the door, he looks at the patient, he waves at the patient, he walks across the room, he shakes the patient's hand, he turns around, he makes the diagnosis, he looks at his watch and he goes, yes, and he's heading out the door, okay? Now, I'm a medical student, right? I'm supposed to learn stuff, all right? I stop him at the door and I say, whoa, wh what did you do? How, how did you know it was that? So this is the funniest part of the whole thing, right? This is what he looked like. He went like this. He went... He looked like he didn't have a clue. Not a clue. And I'm thinking, what, what are we paying? I can throw darts at a diagnostic board just like anybody. I thought you knew what you were doing, I'm thinking to myself. But then he started to talk, and he said, well, when I opened the door, there weren't any of these smells in the room. And so that meant this part of the diagnostic tree fell away, so that wasn't what was going on. And then when I looked at the patient and I waved at him, he looked right back at me and waved back at me, right? So that meant a bunch of the neurological tree that could have been the, 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 the cause of this thing. That went away. And then as I got closer to him, I could see that the color of his skin, the color of his eyes, as I shook his hands, the muscle tone that he had, I could see he didn't have to... He was a walking diagnostic machine. Data was pouring in. He didn't lick the patient. He didn't actually lick the patient, okay? So <laughs> four, four, okay, not, not all five, four, right? But almost every sense was deployed, okay? And, and, and yet, he did not know what he had done, just like driving. This was simple enough for him that he could think about lunch and what he was going to order and what he was going to have while just the processor ran. It was like, yeah, yeah, and he moved on. And he had to, just like when you get home, can you remember what were the red and green lights? No way. You, you don't remember anything that happened along the way. He didn't remember his red and green lights either. Right? So what happens is, in fact, experts are these amazing pre-wired processors of information. Right? The expertise they have is, is, is in chunking information. It actually changes how they look at the world. They process the world differently and eat at a very deep level. I'm a lousy chess player. I mean, I'm not even kidding. You know, sometimes people say I'm a lousy chess player, and you look at their grandmaster, but not the best. I'm literally not a good chess player. And so whenever I have somebody who's watching over my shoulder who knows how to play chess, it's like totally embarrassing, right? Because the guy will look at me and say, didn't you see this coming? Didn't you see this piece was like a threat? A, a threat? Don't you even know what a rook is? You know, what are you doing? And in fact, people have measured, done brain scans on chess masters' brains. And literally, their visual system fires differently than somebody who's an idiot like me at chess, right? Literally, they're vi so when they say, didn't you see, it's not necessarily a metaphor. Their visual system is processing patterns that mine are not wired to recognize at all, right? So this is extraordinary. So this is actually what we're trying to get our students to. This is what expertise actually looks like. This is actually what we're after. This is what we're trying to get to. So how do we get there? Well, it's, we're Americans, right? So it's about talent, right? It's about gifts. It's about the natural athlete, right? Look at any, you know, of the athletic talk shows or whatever. They love to talk about the natural athletes, right? That's, that, that's where it all comes from, right? It's all about talent. Years ago, when my youngest son was about six years old, uh, he got into martial arts. He loved martial arts, karate especially. And uh, he started to get belts. And I mean, not like slowly. I mean, like they just poured like rain onto the guy. I mean, it was unbelievable, right? He was just collecting these belts like over and over. And the other parents are like, oh, he's so talented. He's so talented. He's so gifted. You're so lucky, right? <laughs> what they didn't see is he was thinking about karate morning, noon, and night. When he was having breakfast, he was doing katas with one hand while he was spooning the cereal with the other hand, right? Okay? He was doing this. He'd go around the house 
all day long, right? You know, he'd be doing that all day long, right? Every chair was a threat, you know, <laughs> right? The dog learned to stand exactly three and a half feet away because, whew, and that way the dog was like, whew, didn't have to move, didn't have to move, didn't have to move, right? The guy was working it, right? All the time from morning, noon, and night, right? That's actually how he did it. And so it's not, it's about work, right? It's about work. And this is what actually the cognitive psychologists have found as well. This is what really drives your success, is hard work. How many of you have, uh, have uh, read the Gladwell book, Outliers? Yeah, yeah. so many of you have heard the expression 10,000 hours, 10,000 hours of deliberate practice. It is roughly 10 years of half-time work. And if you think about a lot of careers, that's about right. To get from medical school all the way through to being a full practicing physician, it's about a decade. To become a partner in a law firm takes about 10 years. To become a licensed architect, about 10 years. A licensed plumber, it's about 10 years. It's all about 10 years is what it looks like, right? And so, you know, it's, in, it's actually incredibly deliberate practice that's get used to this world-class expertise. What, what Gladwell summarized was research by Anders Ericsson and others, that it is deliberate practice that makes the difference. Uh, there's a famous study of Juilliard musicians looking at to see who became concert uh, uh, level and who became uh, just music teachers and everything in between. And they looked at the early talent and then they compared other parameters. Early talent was almost invisible. What made the difference was almost entirely how much deliberate practice you did. And deliberate practice is tedious. It is a microscopic examination of the gap between what you're doing and what expert performance is, piece by piece by piece, and then very specific training and feedback and coaching to get better and better and better. It's so tedious. Who would ever do that? Only people who are incredibly passionate about it. They don't buy into the myth of talent. They don't, they work. They work anyway because they want to get better. That's what they're all about. They want to get better. That's exactly what they're all about. So it's the work that really fully drives the talent, right? And it's the passion that ends up driving this forward. Now, this is terrifically good news for students who are having difficulties, for people who want to change careers, because it means the only thing in their way. You know, if you're four foot two and you're trying to get to the NBA, we have to talk, okay? There's career issues, okay, okay, okay. I mean, there's edge cases, don't, don't, don't take this completely, right? But, but for the most part, you can get there. It's the work, right? You just have to want it enough to do the deliberate practice. And what we need to do is build the learning environments that get you there, right? Now, there's a dark side to this. Many of you have dreams, have had dreams of things you wanted to do when you were younger. You, know, you wanted to be an artist. You, know, you wanted to be a dancer. You wanted to be a singer. You wanted to be an accountant. Um, you know, <laughs> you, you wanted to be a doctor, you, you know? And, and you didn't do it. And you know, you weren't good enough. People told you, you don't have the talent you need for that. You know, you just don't. So, you know, but here's the dark side. Tomorrow morning, when you look in the mirror, the only question you have to ask yourself is why don't you care enough about this to spend 10,000 hours of deliberate practice? That's the only question you have to ask. And you know what? Opening the gate is not that easy for the horse. But the gate is open. Well, so let's say we took this. Now he said, let's make a great learning environment. You know, let's build something that has a, a lot of different pieces to it, right? So let's imagine we have a competency-based system, right? As you do better, it goes faster. You know, that it, it speeds up, it slows down based on how you're doing. Uh, as, as you get through one level, it drives the success to the next level. We have other performance things. The online and offline are all in sync. They're not separate companies. They don't talk different languages, use different models. They're actually the same. The at-home work and the in-school work work off the same foundations. Who knew that homework and what you learned in school could be the same, you know, that your university professors would actually refer to the textbooks. I mean, it's very exciting ideas, right? Um, <laughs> practice, I know, I know, I'm crazy, okay? Practice and assessment actually merge. If you have actually technology-based practice environments, right, 
that technology can start to throw off more and more data about how you're doing as you practice. It can tell that you're getting faster. It knows you don't need more hints. It knows you... In fact, your practice will give more information than a test will ever give because it's a lot more work that's being carefully recorded. So practice and assessment become the same things. Data analytics starts to flow. You have information everywhere. Your research guys are working closely together with your practitioners because there's data everywhere. There's a river of data, right? So now, let's say you had a million learners in a system like this. Big school system, let's say. Large university system. A state, right? There are pools of these things, right? What happens? Some numbers. Bear with me. We'll call them the 13 grade levels. Let's do K through 12. Okay, 13 grade levels. Let's say it's 100,000 students per grade level, okay? But now remember, it's competency-based, right? Well, if we have 40 weeks, that's typically what you'd have, 40 weeks of subjects, you know, so sort of think 40 weeks. But now you've got your students evenly spread because they go faster, they go slower. So your fourth grade student uh, in late November, well, they could be in any of the 40 weeks of fourth grade math because they've just been going faster and slower, right? Well, see, now this is really cool because that means on any given day, you've actually got 2,500 students in the fifth week of a 40-week curriculum, right? No matter when you are, the fifth week has got 2,500 students because they're evenly spread. They're evenly spread. This means every week you could run a study. 2,500 students, fractions in fourth grade. You could run a randomized controlled trial study Every single week, you could do 40 years of research in a single year. In five years, you'd have done 200 years of research. Do you think we can break the back of some of these problems with that kind of flow? Now, we've got to be nimble. Probably have to have multiple research groups to share this out, because they can't think that fast, right? But think of the opportunity. That's just fractions. Right? Take the rest of it apart, and now, scale up. You're a person who's looking across these million learners. You're a leader, you're a superintendent, you're the, the, the head of the academics. Let's say it's again K through 12. Four core subjects, 13 years. You have 52 of those pairs, right? 52, well, that's kind of fun. 52, that means every week, you could pick one subject grade level. Fourth grade math, this is the week. And you can look at your data, the flow of data, and you can ask, who has made significant improvements from six months ago in students who are not doing well? Who's made a change in the last six months? And you'd look at the river of data and you'd say, it's the school out here. And you'd see, it's Mrs. Smith. And you'd call Mrs. Smith and you'd say, Mrs. Smith, what did you do? And Mrs. Smith will say, well, I was working with a researcher, or I got an idea from my students, or I read something on the airplane, or I had something weird for breakfast. I mean, who knows what she'll say, right? But now suddenly, you have a new idea to test, right? And that's just one week of oversight. Now you do the second week, and the third week, and the fourth week, right? Imagine how this changes the flow of work. This river of data this current of learner and teacher experiences is exactly what we need to the, get to the other side of this ocean of learning challenges we face. The current is now running. We have to jump into it. Thank you very much. <laughs>